Welcome back. Um, so, so we looked at um, the, how shall we say, the avant-garde in Russia and Germany in the early uh, 1920s and 30s. And now we're going to turn to America and just to see what's happening there at around the same time. Um, so in America, we have um, four individuals that we're going to look at today. And that's Alvin Langdon Colburn, Paul Strand, you're probably familiar with that name, Charles Sheeler, and James Vanderzee, and I know a lot of you are familiar with that name as well. And um, we want to consider how their approach to modernism looked, and it will be different than what we saw in Russia and Germany. Now, when we take Colburn, for instance, in the beginning, um, Colburn was um, he started out more in a pictorialist mode so he kind of goes in many directions and I think that's what uh, maybe you'll find him for pretty interesting he was um, related to F Hollanday and um, he received a camera as a gift on his eighth birthday and he became a serious photographer when he met Edward Steichen um, he that same year he ex exhibited in America and at the Salon of the Linked Ring. So he was one of the early photo secessionists. So he's uh, not necessarily a founding member of the photo secession, but he's one of the early uh, people that are brought into Stieglitz's circle and is photographing, as you can see here, in the pictorialist style. So here we see the bridge at Ipswich. So this wouldn't necessarily be considered modernism, but I wanted to give you a background how someone like this could move from one to the other. Um, Colburn was influenced by a lot of artwork. So we here on the left, we see a Japanese woodblock print. And then we see on the left, James McNear Whistler, his Nocturne Blue and Gold, Old Battersea Bridge. And Colburn, obviously saw this at the Tate Museum and was inspired by it because he was in London and photographed Wapping in London on the right. So there's this really interesting connection. So um, Coburn was definitely interested in, um, in painters and in um, kind of graphic artwork. He also, um, he also, um, Worked for a year in the studio of Gertrude Kazebeer. He was asked to join the linked ring in London. And um, he, he's a person that I don't think ever knew where he belonged, whether it was America or England. So he went back and forth, back and forth, and um, ended up in England. Um, he was always divided between these two countries. Um, okay, so here's where Colburn goes into modernism, and the, it's called Octopus, and it's a view from the Metropolitan Tower in New York City, and I think it's a wonderful example of this kind of move to looking at the world here from a high perspective, but um, he includes a little bit of the, uh, the street, so you're not totally disoriented, and when I say you're not totally disoriented, I'll show you one photograph that does disorient you. So this is from the same, um, same time period when he's photographing. But the octopus is um, one of his signature pieces that um, combines ideas of sort of the curve of the sidewalk, and yet you've got the geometric of the, the block where it's, there's snow on the block, and then you've got the street. So the octopus. Um, I'm only showing you a few of Colburn right now only because um, we want to keep moving, so we have a lot to show you. Um, he was influenced by Cubism as well, and so um, and he associated with this group of, of artists in London who were also in, influenced by Cubism, but they were called Vortices, and you don't need to remember that, but just so you know, they had a little, a little group <clears throat> that uh, made art that showed this interest in um, in kind of that idea of simultaneity or breaking up the volume. And so here we have 
Alvin Langdon Coburn Votograph. So vort vortices Votograph. And he did this by um, photographing through a kaleidoscope. And he made this really fragmented image of whatever he photographed underneath the um, kaleidoscope. And then one more photograph. Then he did all of these, this experimentation in 1917. Okay? So Paul Strand, as I said, you're probably pretty much interested in him or know about him. The last two issues of Alfred Stieglitz's camera work contains photographs by Paul Strand only. So he was, um, he was, um, he caught fire with Stieglitz. I mean, Stieglitz thought he was fabulous. He thought his work was fabulous. Keep in mind that Stieglitz at this point is interested in modernism. He did his pictorial moment and now he's interested in modernism. And Paul Strand's showing him ideas of modernism. So, um, Paul Strand gets his introduction to Stieglitz through being a student of Lewis Hine. So he was a student of Lewis Hine in the cultural, um, ethical cultural school, and um, Lewis Hine takes him to uh, Gallery 291 and introduces him to Stieglitz, and that's what really kind of set his career. But all of it had some influence. So we remember Lewis Hine photographing people um, in, in dire straits that we, we saw he was doing this, oh, maybe just a decade before. And so here's, um, I think, Paul Strand's sort of response to that, where he goes to the Lower East Side, Manhattan, and is showing people um, in sort of interesting um, representations of people on the street. So we have people of home, they're homeless, and this is, um, it's, it's not meant for reform, and it's not meant necessarily to get a reaction. It is just what you see. And this one is usually called Man of Five Point Square, where he's trying to sell a product um, just to eke out an existence. And then this one that's the most famous one called Blind. And... Um, this one wasn't in Five Point Square. This one was taken at Park Avenue between 32nd and 33rd Street because some curious historian decided to figure out where it was taken. But um, I think this one really stands out. And for a few of you who did the blind man daguerreotype formal analysis, this is the one I, th I think about when I think about um, those two kind of juxtaposed. So this woman is aware that um, Paul Strand is photographing her. Keep in mind at this time, um, Strand had, he, he incorporated the real lens tucked underneath his left arm, and so he could kind of hide or camouflage when he was photographing somebody. But at some point, um, somebody hollered, hey, look at that guy, he's you know photographing you or something like that. So he kind of got busted a couple times. But here we see, um, formally, the circular shapes of the eyes, the face, the peddler's badge, the stark lettering neck, t neck tag, so it tells you that she's blind. Whereas when we saw the blind men with the sunglasses on, it didn't, except for the title of it, we n didn't necessarily know. But she is very aware, I think, of her circumstances, and I'm sure she hears the click of hit the shutter. And here's another one that I think is quite um, emblematic of what Paul Strand is doing right now. And this is in Manhattan, and it's called Wall Street. And uh, he here he's catching people. This is um, catching people at the, sort of the end of the day. So the work day is over. You've got the long shadows, the four o'clock, five o'clock shadows. People are all headed in one direction. Maybe they're heading for the train. And so he's got lines going in that direction. And plus, you've got the vertical lines, the alternating, alternating dark and light of the structure. It, it's quite a dynamic piece. So he continues to do this sort of formal, formal work where he's doing close-ups of things. This looks like it was at a market. They're sort of ceramic pieces. 
and then a stairwell and uh, how the shadows create new geometric shapes as the shadow is cast down. Um, so it's, it's, it's quite, it's just totally a geometric abstract representation. And this one's quite well known, the White Fence, uh, Port Kent, New York, 1916. Um, <clears throat> it's one of the boldest photographs of the period, some people have said. He sort of deliberately <clears throat> destroyed the perspective. It's kind of like, where exactly was he photographing? Where was he standing? Did he stoop down? Um, so there's sort of this tense uh, energy of the picket fence emphasized by these geometric shapes and the organization and by the abrupt tonal transition between fence and pasture. So Strand is showing you what maybe other artists are going to be showing you, um, photographing industry of the day. And this particular one shows the accolade camera and the double accolade. These are motion picture cameras, and this would be like in the 1920s. So you see the beautiful steel, the shine, the light on it. It's, it's um, embracing and celebrating modern um, industry. And this one is quite wonderful, the lathe. Um, and I want you to look at the sort of the curve of this. And uh, in, well, it has geometric sort of rectangular shapes, many that you could focus on, but then there's this curve of the upper right-hand corner of this lathe, and then we look at something <clears throat> that he photographed in uh, New Mexico, in Taos, New Mexico, when he went out to see Georgia O'Keeffe, who was now living in the New Mexico area, he traveled out to Taos. And this building still stands in Taos, New Mexico, quite wonderful, just um, just a, a, a grand abstraction and a detail of the Rancho de Taos. I'm just going to run through a few of these quickly because they don't uh, hit the time frame we're on, but this is um, 1950s, so Paul Strand has a has an ex really long career. Um, his, his career is just amazing, and after World War II, he finds the politics here to be uncomfortable because there is sort of this, uh, the McCarthy hearings where they're looking for people who suspect to be um, socialists or communists, and so he decides to go to Europe, and here, these photographs are from Europe. Okay, Charles Sheeler. Charles Sheeler, he's both, both a painter and a photographer, and he and um, Paul Strand form this partnership, and they make a fabulous movie, and um, you can find it anytime on YouTube. It's just called Manhattan, and I think it's, uh, it, depending which version you look at, it's about a 20-minute video, but it was so uh, well-received that it was sent to Europe to be in an avant-garde uh, sort of cinema um, exhibition. So, Charles Sheeler. So, he's a painter who is best known for his precise rendering, sometimes called precisionist. Um, he is interested in industrial forms in which abstract formal qualities were emphasized. So, he studied in Philadelphia, and um, he was exposed to the modernist uh, European painters, the Cezans, Picassos, Matisse of the day, and he turned to photography around 1912. Initially, he worked on assignments from Philadelphia architects, and he, so he photographed art and architecture, and he, he did this for money, uh, but he was really a painter. Uh, but later then, he, like I said, he connected with, um, with Paul Strand. So here we see this wonderful side of a white barn. So it's just abstraction. It's just pure texture, line, um, and, and there's a little bit of interesting contrast here. Uh, so this is when he was photographing 
uh, on an assignment out in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. And he's um, at this Doyle's Town House where he's photographing all aspects of it. Um, but a lot of these photographs were used actually for painting. So this um, kind of underneath a stairwell, um, in a corner, a window, very abstract because you don't have the context really. And this gives you an idea of what he did. The photo on the left of this doorway and the stairway and then the painting on the right. Uh, the, the photographs I'm going to show you, uh, one or two of them, uh, this will appear in Manhattan in the, in the movie. And uh, I think what's kind of exciting, this is, the 19, this is 1920, it, this is taken from the 41st story Equitable Building. And um, I don't know, when you think about New York at this time, I guess I don't think of skyscrapers quite at that height, but it, there were a lot of soaring skyscrapers. And then here we've got the same, well not the exact same view, but relatively the same view from the 41st uh, Equitable Building. And you see on the left the photograph and then the right as it turned out in Sheeler's painting and another painting offices. So he continued to do advertisement. That became a source of income for him. He actually did some work for um, some of the Vogue and Vanity Fair, but his pictures of people were never that popular. He didn't seem to gravitate toward people. So this is, I think, one of his most famous projects. Um, he was invited to go to Ford Motor Company's plant in River Rouge, um, in River Rouge, um, outside of Detroit. And Ford Motor Company had had a bad year the previous year, in 1926. So he was there and invited to photograph. And so he made a number of photographs. Um, he made this interesting series of photographs. He was there for six weeks. 32 of his photographs appeared in periodicals in Europe and Asia and America, and it was used for the annual stockholders book. If you see more of his images from the River Rouge, um, he mostly shows the monumentality of industry. And you see kind of a few images of people, but he emphasizes the monumentality of Ford Motor Company's plant. So this is quite, um, quite a signature piece for Sheeler. And then here a few that he did. Um, I'm not sure what these were made for, but he used them for uh, his uh, paintings. So a ship funnel, the upper deck, and then you see the photograph on the left of the upper deck and then how it turned out in the painting on the right. So James Van Der Zee, We've, um, a lot of you have been introduced to James Van Der Zee and he, sort of like Colburn, moves from maybe one style to the next and he's very versatile and so we want to consider how his look was um, at one point and then how he gradually maybe moved on to something more, considered more modern. So James Van Der Zee is one of the great portraitists of the 20th century. He worked in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, and um, he imbued his, the New York Harlem community with elegance and dignity. And a lot of you saw this image, couple in raccoon coats, and you wrote about it. So this is, I, I call this one of his signature pieces. And, to me, this one is the one that represents modernism. So we'll look at this first and talk about why does this represent modernism. Well, first of all, the couple looks successful, right? They're in beautiful fur coats. They've got a gorgeous car. You see chrome. You see that shiny, uh, wonderful um, metallic of this automobile. So it kind of reeks of ideas of uh, modernity and success. And if you think about it, the photograph was made in 1932. America was in the throes of depression at this moment, so it is interesting. 
And I think interesting too, when you look at the staircase or stair, stairs behind it, which is across the street slightly, but it sort of looks at this rise in society. So you can think of this as a metaphor for this couple rising up in society. Okay, so just to give you a little bit of background, this is the Van Der Zee family, the males of the family, Van Der Zee women. So, you know, they're a tight-knit group. And then these are some of his early works. So this would be um, pertaining to World War I, and he, he does a lot of collaging, or shall we say, um, his way of doing this would be to print sort of... Um, uh, on on the negative, so he's printing uh, two images, so the image that exists, and then he superimposes another image. So, it, and, and then on the lower left, you will occasionally see this little dog. It's a signature to his. This is his studio portraiture. So um, here, the soldier is sort of dreaming and thinking about when he was back in maybe France, and he's observing the death of one of his uh, fellow. Um, soldiers. And we see couples, he's, he, again, I think it reflects the, the uh, raccoon coat couple, and uh, here we see another couple that look successful. Um, what's interesting about this, though, Van Der Zee has kind of an old-fashioned looking um, studio, well, at least his studio props are old-fashioned where they're painted, and um, painted backgrounds and other sort of scenes that he has created for his studio, but it, I think it makes it sort of warm. It really makes it look 19th century and not 20th century, when indeed these are 20th century. And here we have another look at a successful man. We see his watch, we see his, um, his vest and suit, and he just has that sort of demeanor of success. So this is another image um, the wedding portrait and uh, sort of this double printing where he's got the future expectations is the title and it's the couple on their wedding or their wedding portrait we'll see and here it gives you a sense of his backgrounds where we see a sort of a faux fireplace and then he has superimposed the image of the little girl on the left so that is quote the future expectation and uh, so he did a number of advertisements and different type of photograph. This one's just entitled Nude by Fireplace. It's that same fireplace we saw in the previous image. Um, but the addition of the fur, it's, it's a sexy, kind of sensual um, representation. He is trying to show dignity and progress in the African American community. Um, one more from this um, era of uh, post-World War I, where we have decorated veterans, but in the upper left is the superimposed image, and we see um, a nurse, we see a wounded soldier, and we see another soldier, and they're all clustered together. And it appears that the two that are being photographed are discussing this situation. And what I think is kind of interesting, too, like you see a one man is leaning against a piano. So um, just another prop in the studio. So James Van Der Zee also did a lot of street photography, so documentary work, and he's showing the community out on, in parades, etc. So this is Marcus Garvey in Regalia. So uh, Marcus Garvey... Um, was an important figure in the um, in the Harlem community at the time. And then one more, the United Negro Improvement Association. So you see the parade. So actual documentary work. Um, so James Van Der Zee had a long, long career. And in 1962, he was in an exhibition, Harlem on My Mind, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, where his works featured, at, at, were featured and reached an international audience and were appreciated. His first solo retrospective in 1970 traveled and earned renewed attention for the next two decades. 
celebrities sought him out for portraits during his final years. Boxer Muhammad Ali, actor Bill Cosby, artist Romar Reardon, and singer Lou Rawls. After a career that spanned 80 years, Van Der Zee died at the age of 97 in Washington, D.C. Thank you, everybody. See you next time.